Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we're going to be talking about the book. We're going to be reviewing the book, Win Bigly, Persuasion in the World Where Facts Don't Matter. And this is by Scott Adams. Scott Adams, famous for being the artist of the Dilbert comics. And lately, he's delved into politics. He talks about politics. And he was one of the biggest, quote unquote, Trump supporters. He didn't quite support Trump except for in the fact that he saw Trump as a master persuader. And so that's what a lot of his blog articles, a lot of his talks are about, how Trump persuaded America to vote for him, how Trump won the election. And that's what this book is about as well. This book is about persuasion. I'm reviewing it because there's a lot of elements that we could take and we could understand, we could apply to the open theism debate, the open theism are issues that we're dealing with constantly. And one thing he talks about in his book are these different filters. People in America were living in in two different bubbles, two different worlds. And, and the, the prevalent uh, idea, the prevalent bubble was that everyone's progressive. We all need to adopt these uh, leftist regressive ideas. And, and Hillary Clinton was the shoe in candidate because all of America stood behind her. All of America shares these these values, except for just a small handful of racists. You have to be a racist, you have to be a sexist, you have to be just a terrible person not to be part of this this Hillary bubble, this this Hillary campaign. You, if you don't support Hillary, you're one of these fringe lunatics. But then what happened? There was a system shock. Trump won the election, and not by a small margin, by a landslide. And so you, you quickly look to see how the narrative changes. The narrative changes to there's not just the small handful of racists. That's what they convinced themselves. That people voting for Trump, they love Hitler because Trump is the new Hitler. And so all these, America has this now this a massive Nazi problem because half of America voted for Trump. Wow, we didn't know that this, this racism was out of control, that uh, all of America is racist, apparently. We thought it was a small handful of people. Uh, but once this election happened, once our bubble was shattered, the only way that we could cope with it, because our ex expectations did not line up with reality, is to claim that our expectations were super way off. And just all of America, they just hate uh, black people and minorities and stuff like that. Y you saw that happen in the election. And they said, oh, we didn't know there was all these Nazis. All these Nazis, right? But it's, it's, it's crazy. It's lunacy. It's lunacy how these people act. They thought their outlook on the world. There's two different movies. The second movie that happened during this election were the people, the blue collar workers, uh, the conservatives who saw Trump as a persuader, uh, someone who who's rational, reasonable, uh, brought in good policies. The wall was big talk during the election, really resonated with individuals. And this book talks about why the, the book that we're going to be going over today. But it's just interesting to see how these two bubbles, which which bubble didn't implode. It was the Trump supporter bubble did not implode. It was the it was the Hillary Clinton, everyone who disagrees with me is a racist. That bubble imploded. It broke. And they said, Trump is going to be the new Hitler. Really? Really? After four years, are they going to still be saying that? And that's what Scott Adams, he always writes about. So they're going to start with this Hitler phase. Oh, Trump is Hitler. And then they're going to say, oh, he's just incompetent. So they'll move from Hitler to incompetent. And then they're going to move from Oh, he's competent, but we just don't like what he does. You know, it's a slow progression as their reality collapsed because they've built themselves, they surrounded themselves with this false reality of what's going on. And Calvinists are the same way. They're, they're, they're highly delusional when I talk to them. And they, they bring their own specific outlook onto the world, onto the Bible, onto any, any time they interact with people in the real world. And a good example of that is this debate, this guy that we roasted just last podcast, this Dr. Zacharides. And to remember, this guy was a raving lunatic. He's raving about jungles and he's raving about air conditioners and man being a worm. Just nonsense. Absolute nonsense. This guy went off the deep end. And Calvinists love this guy. Look at this. This is from Penn and Pulpit. And Penn and Pulpit is this Calvinist site. And they say, Oh, man, I, I haven't listened to Theodore Zacharias before, but he was easily the most interesting part of the debate. Zacharias is a brimstone, fuming, fire-breathing, get-off-my-lawn Calvinist, if there ever was one. Zacharias is from London, educated at Ontario Theological Seminary. 
they just give this guy accolades. They say that we love it. We love that uh, he he was not apologetic and he just said all my opponents are heretics and we we just reject what you say and and screaming at them. Okay, okay. After falsely falsely telling Leighton Flowers that the debate was going to be civil, it was going to be about the issues. There wasn't going to be heretic callings. So these Calvinists they bait these Arminians and and. Layton Flower says he's not an Arminian. I'm using the more common definition, basically anyone who's not a Calvinist. They bait these people to come to this debate, and then they just hurl abuse at them. Hurl abuse. These guys are scummy people. Theodore Zacharias is pure scum. But the Calvinists love them. They're living in this bubble world where it's okay to just bully and demean people who disagree with you. These guys are the regressive leftists. Calvinists are the third wave feminists, the people who don't want debate, they don't want discussion, they want to bully people, they don't care about facts, they don't care about logic, they don't care about the Bible. And you really see this cognitive dissonance just surface in them. They say, oh, we need to reject all these different uh, Bible verses about, about how God acts and how God thinks and how God changes. And instead, we need to focus on these small, tiny phrases. See this small, tiny phrase? means God's outside of time, eternally immutable, and in a pure singularity, actuality. That's what that means, they say. It's cognitive dissonance. They just reject large portions of the Bible to pull out absurd meanings on small phrases that, to support their views. It's this weird filter. And their filter's collapsing. Their filter's collapsing as biblical scholarship becomes more mainstream, more people are getting into the Michael Heisers of the world, caring about the biblical material. People now care about what the Bible says, and they care about the biblical worldview. And the more and more this comes out, the more and more the Bible is championed above this uh, bringing metaphysics into the Bible, you know, their, their, their bubble is going to collapse. Their bubble is going to collapse. So that's kind of the reason I focus a lot on scholarship. Calvinist theology is not scholarship. They reject scholarship. They have to reject scholarship and normal reading comprehension standards in order to maintain their theology. Their filter, their cognitive dissonance that it creates, you know, they, they, they can't deal with it. They can't deal with the text when you bring up the text to them. So that's what this book is about. Win Bigly, Persuasion in a World Where Facts Does Not Matter. And let's kind of start from the beginning. This book is very written fluidly. So it kind of jumps around a little bit for topics. It's a very short book, maybe about... Uh, two to three hours, maybe four hours, if you're reading it straight through. And uh, if, if you want to save yourself some money, just watch his periscopes, read his blog, kind of the same information. Some of these chapters actually are just rehashing his old blog posts. But the book's all about persuasion. How do you persuade an audience? And we're just kind of going to kind of go through it in order because that's, that's what makes sense. Let's talk about visuals. Good rule is that people are more influenced by visual persuasion, emotion, repetition, and simplicity than they are by details and facts. And this is a book subtitled Persuasion in a World Where Facts Do Not Matter. The facts don't matter. People don't care about the facts. I've learned this firsthand. I think I've recounted my story before when I was debating in high school, this individual, and it was about uh, Hiroshima. Was it okay? Was it a good thing for America to nuke Japan in World War II? And, and guess who won the debate? It wasn't me, the uncharismatic person who just wants to talk facts, details, uh, possible casualty rates, uh, cost-benefit analysis. It wasn't me. It was the guy making the jokes, the guy trying to be funny, charismatic, and confident. Those are the people who win the debate. It, it's, it's weird how that works, even in America. Remember, remember the presidential election where it was Howard Dean? His entire campaign imploded because he went like this, we're going to South Dakota, aye, and his entire, no one wanted to vote for him after that. It's like, what? Don't you guys care about this guy's policy? No, I'm not like a Democrat or anything. I didn't support the guy or anything. But just the fact that all these voters would not vote for someone who got riled up at a rally, it's just, it's ludicrous. His entire career imploded after that point. Trump was able to avert this. Trump was able to get away with a lot more than Howard Dean ever did. And that's what's discussed in this book. 
one of Scott Adams' proofs about how visual is better than audio, better than anything else, that's kind of why I like doing the YouTube videos in addition to the podcast. First of all, the podcast was great for just getting me in the rhythm of talking, being able to talk without having to interrupt myself time and time again. So I could just talk fluidly. Yeah, so that's good to train me up like that. But the YouTube videos is where, really where it shines when you interject video on top of the audio. You become more persuasive. It's, it's this uh, thing in human brains that, that prioritizes the visual over the audio. And Scott Adams uses this example. He calls it the McGurk effect. He doesn't call it that. The world calls it that. And the idea is if you Google this and you look at this video, you could see a guy and the guy's saying, ba, ba, ba. But if his mouth is moving in a way that it looks like he's saying fa, 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 our audio changes the ba's that are the actual audio to the fa's. Our perception of the sound is influenced by our visuals. It's, it's a crazy effect. So what does Trump do during the election? He talks about a wall, something visual, something that we could all imagine in our own minds. And he doesn't give very many details. He doesn't describe it in detail. He allows the audience to fill in the details with their own imagination. Each person constructs this wall in their own mind. And the media, they go crazy and they say, this wall's absurd, look at all the costs, and they start running figures and numbers. But by then it's already sold. They're already imagining a wall that's built. And they're feeding into it. They're transferring energy in the election to this wall. And who's our wall candidate? It's Trump, it's not Hillary. So they talk about the wall, people visualize the wall, and Trump is the wall candidate. And it, it's a really effective persuasion tool that his enemies, his enemies gave him publicity. That his enemies gave him clout. His enemies championed that as the primary issue of the election. They focused the energy into the point that he was stronger at than his opponent. So it's funny how that works. It's funny how that works. So visuals are better than audio. Visuals don't always work the best, especially if you're in a debate and your, your video or audio fails, like the Enyart White debate. Enyart showed up and he wanted to add multimedia to the debate, and it just didn't work. And, and uh, James White points this out, that the Enyart version of the debate that's hosted on the Enyart site has inserted audio that was not part of the original debate because their audio did fail. It's interesting. It's interesting. So make sure your audio works if you're in a debate. But then Scott Adams goes on to talk about filters. Every one of us, every person, human being, naturally views the world through a filter. We, 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 we try to see it through, through our own perspectives. And sometimes our filters don't align with reality. We, we only figure out if our filter's lining with reality, if it's a good predictor of the future, if it's a good predictor of, of what happens in the world. And in this last election, this regressive leftist filter collapsed. It was not a correct perception of the world. They perceived, you know, anyone who disagrees with me as a racist and America's not like that and we're, we're a progressive nation. And then it collapsed. Everyone voted for Trump. And so a lot of their narratives just changed to all Trump race, voters are racist. Racism's now a huge problem in this country. Half of America hates minorities. Half of America hates black people. What? What? This is, this is how they actually think. They actually think that people were voting for Hitler. That They convinced themselves of that. They equated Trump to Hitler. And Scott Adams talks about how this, this hatred of Trump, this, this equating them to Hitler, is going to gradually fade out as their bubble continues to collapse. They're going to start with these claims that Trump is Hitler. Then they're going to move on to, oh, Trump is not Hitler, but he's just incompetent. And then lastly, they're going to end up in, oh, Trump is competent. We just don't like what he does. This is how their world's going to break down. This is how their world's going to collapse. And again, the Calvinists are the regressive lefts. The Calvinists have built themselves this bubble. Every time they read the Bible, they say, oh, I got my theology. Oh, I like sovereignty. So let's go find a text. And here's one in Isaiah. And it's about God doing things. Oh, see, I like that. I like it. It, it fits my sovereignty. Never mind that it contradicts all my other attributes of God. It contradicts, contradicts timelessness, unchangeability, pure simplicity, outside of time. Isaiah counters all of that stuff, all that nonsense. <laughs> but, but it does talk about God's power. 
So I'm going to adopt this. I'm going to point to it every time I want to talk about God's power. I'm just going to ignore the fact that it contradicts everything else I believe about God. That's how their persuasion filter works. It, cognitive dissonance. They, they want to maintain that the Bible describes this pure simplicity, outside of time, pure actuality God that they have in their own head. And it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. And their nar narrative collapses at any time that they come into interaction with anyone who knows anything about the Bible, uh, cement, Semitic religions, anything about uh, scholarship. And that's why I point that out. What do I appeal to in debates? I appeal to biblical scholarship because, you know, biblical scholarship is not always right. They're not always, but you got to acknowledge what they're saying and why they're saying it. And Calvinists, they want to ignore that. They don't want to even consider that or let it affect their worldview because that creates the cognitive dissonance. They want to ignore that. Bringing it up plays havoc with their mind. Uh, appeal to the common man. How would a common person read XYZ passage? Now, now not, not only are they against scholars, they're against common reading comprehension skills. And it's funny. It, it creates... It creates all this tension in there. You can see it. You can see it in their faces if you're talking to them. You can see it online if you're debating with them. They, they don't want to interact with this. Oh, all people, they're all fallen. So, so they, 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 they gradually appeal to this, this idea that only the enlightened people can read the Bible. Scholars are all wrong. Reading comprehension, normal reading comprehension standards are all wrong. And you just have to embrace Calvinism. You just have to... Just see it in the Bible. You just have to ignore the texts that contradict everything about Calvinism. And you just have to take your little two-word proof text that there's a small little phrase and see that, that that's, that's your evidence. That's your proof that the Bible supports this crazy idea of who God is and what he does and how he acts. This pure simplicity, immutability being. Guess what? Uh, it takes an amazing amount of intellectual dishonesty to maintain these ideas. And it's funny. It's funny. So I like discussing things with Calvinists. I like talking about the Bible. And one thing I do that this book talks about is this high ground maneuver where you, you take their criticism, like, you'll, you know, they'll try to criticize, oh, your, your systematic theology doesn't work as well. Okay, sure. I'm sure. I don't care about systematic theology. Let's talk about the Bible. It's a high ground maneuver because what they pretend to champion over everything is the Bible. And so you take the debate, you turn it about the Bible, you disarm their attempts to try to talk their systematic theology, which they really love, and that's what they're deep into. I don't care about that stuff. I'm not going to give energy to that part of the debate. Turn it to the Bible. What does the Bible say? So if the Bible contradicts your crazy systematic theology that you love so much and you want to talk about, you're rejecting the Bible. And that's the high ground maneuver. This book talks about the high ground maneuver where where Trump moves on and from, uh, from, from people trying to trip him up with the small details and he refocuses them to the larger details. He, he changes the energy. He moves the energy in the debate from what people want to talk about to something else. One thing that was interesting in the presidential election, and I got the clip pulled up and we could play the clip, is when Trump was being asked questions about possible past sexual a misconduct or demeaning women and we'll play that clip megan kelly i like megan kelly but this is funny one of the things people love about you is you speak your mind and you don't use a politician's filter however that is not without its downsides in particular when it comes to women you've called women you don't like fat pigs dogs slobs and disgusting animals your twitter account only rosie several... o'donnell Your Twitter account. Thank you. Uh, let's try One to get, things... get her face. To get her face. Oh, there's her face. There's her face. So he disarmed the question. So it wasn't. He didn't answer the question with facts. He didn't. He wasn't like other politicians who are like, "Oh, I'm sorry for my past mistakes." He refocuses the energy of the room, and you hear it as soon as he says Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell's visual. And he's associating her with all these names that Megyn Kelly just threw out. And uh, Rosie O'Donnell is, uh, no one in Donald Trump's base likes her. And so he refocuses all the energy into this room, 
to this uh, personal assault against a popular target and disarms the question. He sucks all the energy. The question was dead on arrival. And you see Megan Kelly and she's, she sees that she sees that the entire point that she's trying to make has just been demantled, de- destroyed. And it's it's not that he answered her. He did. He he didn't give her uh, answer a factually based answer. He did a redirect, and he he stole the energy from the room. And it's funny, and he does this. He does this a lot, where he gives non answers uh, with these 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 different maneuvers to refocus on what he wants to talk about rather than what other individuals want to. And I think after this clip, uh, that didn't show it, but then he talks about political correctness. That's the high ground maneuver. He doesn't want to talk about these, these different allegations. He wants to talk about a meta subject. He redirects to something higher and something that more lofty. Political correctness is a big issue in the campaign. All these colleges shutting down free speech, telling students they can't uh, say and do certain things. It's an issue that resonates. So he shifts shifts the debate. But it's just interesting. So so is Trump, is he just lucky or is he a master persuader who's able to get people to agree with him, to trust him because of his maneuvers? And, and he's funny. And all these lists of reasons why Trump won the election that uh, the regressive media has put out Never, never do you say see a little item that says Trump is hilarious. They don't. They don't want to acknowledge his humor that everyone laughs at. Every, all these there's compilations. If you, Donald Trump's most savage moments is one of the the po, two two point four million views. Okay, so that's that's one of the links here on this YouTube. This this video itself has uh, almost uh, eight hundred thousand views. This Trump Rosie O'Donnell montage of insults. 1.3 million views. People love it. People love his humor. He's able to not answer questions, maneuver, change energy to where he wants it to go. These are all persuasion techniques. Persuasion techniques. So I think that's a useful takeaway. So when these Calvinists, they want to they want to get in the weeds, they want to talk about philosophy or something like that. Something that they re- they really love predestination. They really love their idea of meticulous sovereignty. A high ground maneuver. You could disarm them with a joke and move to the high ground. Let's talk about the Bible instead. Refocus to the Bible. Does your passage, does that actually support? Sure, sovereignty, micromanagement, God makes everyone rape everyone. Sure, that's fine. Um, But let's talk about the Bible because the Bible doesn't hold that view. And you're reading this passage wrong. You refocus to the Bible. Move them back to the Bible. The Bible is their weak point. Their little philosophy, their their emotions they're trying they're the ones trying to use emotions to trump logic to trump debate this is how they persuade their followers they're all hyped up on who they want god to be in their deepest of hearts they want him to be controlling and 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 micromanage everything it's their emotions their emotions you refocus them to something higher something meta don't talk about their emotions that's their strong ground don't talk about the points they want to talk about that, that's, that's what they want to talk about. Refocus the debate, refocus the energy in the room back to the Bible, back to the Bible, because that is their weak point. They don't know the Bible. They don't understand the Bible. They can't read the Bible. They bring absurd ideas into the Bible. They, they take little phrases and make them into absurd ideas. And then they ignore and they, and they cognitive dissonance is interjected into their views when they have to dismiss large, large sections of the Bible even the context of their own proof text, even the context of their own proof text, they have to ignore. Malachi, I, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you're not destroyed. The context is that God responds to people. The context is that God, if they return to God, God will return to them. The, the context is a relationship. And remember, in pure actuality, simplicity, immutability, timelessness, there is no relationship. Nothing can be related to God in any sense of the word. The entire section, even the the last part of the chapter, the last part of the chapter, this is hilarious. Uh, God writes a list of individuals who are faithful to him such that he doesn't accidentally punish them when uh, the day of the Lord happens. That's the, literally the last part of Malachi 3. Oh, just, we'll just skip over that part. That, that part which totally, totally undermines our modern concepts of uh, omniscience and knowing all things, whatever, whatever. It, uh, 
refocus to the Bible. That's that's what the Bible says. It's 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 not it's not a Greek religion. It's not a Greek religion. It's a religion about Yahweh, the creator God, the God of Israel. It's not a religion about this perfectly immutable outside of time being that you would find in Plato, the Neoplatonists, the Gnostics. It's not that type of religion. Refocus them to the text. So cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is the, the feeling in our mind when our worldview is presented with alternative facts, facts that don't align to our previously held beliefs. And there's certain tells, and the tells are important, especially uh, as illustrated by Scott Adams in this book. And one of them is, you know, after Trump won, the fact that there's reasons that people claim for him winning, that's not the tell of cognitive dissonance. The quality of those explanations is not. The quantity is. How many reasons are thrown out? And uh, CNN, he lists 24 different theories, 24 different theories why Trump won. And guess what? Not a single one of them was Trump is funny or Trump is a good persuader or Trump resonated with the voters. So let's look at this like Russian hacking, Russian hacking, Russian hacking. <laughs> yeah, this delusion that a Russians uh, influenced election in any way. It's a delusion. There's zero evidence of it. And basically, it's uh, these these uh, port scans that come from Russian IP addresses. Oh, no. Guess what? I bet my computer's been Russian hacked like a trillion different times because port scans are the most common method of uh, probing for insecurities. And there's all sorts of uh, hackers in Russia. Okay. All right. Okay. Americans are biased against the ruling class in Washington. That might be that might be a little bit true. Trump was an outsider. He might have pulled a little bit. But, you know, the number of reasons. They they offered all these these compilations. Hillary Clinton put out a book called What Happened, which was filled with all sorts of crazy rants about why she didn't win. Just a whole hodgepodge. She went into full overdrive. She was, the night of the election, she was ranting. And she's a very violent uh, violent and abusive person anyways she's she's uh, assaulted her husband multiple times which it could be understandable because he's had multiple affairs against her and he's uh, caused a lot of problems for her political career his his infidelity and the things he's done but she's abusive and she's she's attacked him she's thrown stuff at him um, and in one story I was talking to a guy who was in a helicopter with both of them and Secret Service he was flying the helicopter and uh, she was just in the back, just wailing on him, just beating him up. And uh, the helicopter pilot turns back to see what's going on. And the Secret Service guy redirects him. Like, no, you stay out of this. She's just a, she's a wicked, wicked person. Th that's, that's who she is. So the night of the election, she was screaming, throwing a fit, uh, drinking a lot of alcohol. She's an alcoholic. And she didn't even concede in a timely fashion because she didn't even conceive it as a possibility. She spent all this money on her like election ball and it all fell apart. So it's funny. She, she was living in her own self-constructed bubble. And we see this bubble in her book with uh, just all sorts of hallucinogenic reasons why she didn't win. None of which that she's unlikable, she's corrupt, and she's evil. <laughs> right? All right. So let's go to another sign of cognitive dissonance. Okay, this, It's this response with people hallucinating you're saying something you're not you say oh god doesn't know the future oh you think god's ignorant oh okay well you know cognitive dissonance especially if you like couple it with a verse it says god thought this would happen but then this happened and this this is the verse described in isaiah in jeremiah in genesis it doesn't matter where you put a verse you say god doesn't know the future and then they say oh you think god's ignorant oh you think god is not infinite Oh, you think God isn't perfect. Oh, you think God is flawed. So a mocking word and absurd absolute where they're hallucinating that you're saying a point or making a claim that you're actually not, which is just their own projections onto the debate. How about this? A mocking word or a personal insult that's more aggressive than the situation seems warranted. Like, oh, you're a heretic. <laughs> you're a heretic. You're a heretic for reading the Bible and posting the Bible and talking about what the Bible means. That, that's their claim. That's their claim. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant. And so it's good to disarm those things and uh, mock them right back. And that's one thing that Trump did. Trump wasn't passive. People, like, like, when you think of your common, typical Republican, and I've been following politics for a while, 
uh, people will attack them. They'll say, oh, you need to apologize for this. You said this. It sounds racist. You said this. It sounds disrespectful for women. And so you need to apologize. And the Republicans, uh, conservatives, will bend over backwards to apologize to these people. And apologies are never good enough for a social justice warrior. That's one of, one of the rules of uh, social justice warriors. They always eat their own. Uh, they they never accept your apology. They they, they blow every. I I have to look up the different rules for social justice warriors. But one of them is that a, one apology is never good enough. They will try to destroy your life. So you never apologize to these people. That's a bad. It's a bad strategy to apologize to people who apology is not good enough. Their goal is not to get you to give an apology. Their goal is to destroy your life. And these guys, they hate 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 Trump. And Trump knew this coming into the election that he's going to take all, all the assaults and attacks on him so far are going to be nothing compared to what's going to come after he started running for election. Remember, he wasn't he wasn't racist. There's no no claims that he's racist or sexist or anything like that until he started running as a Republican, right? So out of the woodwork, you have all sorts of uh, attacks on him against who he is as a person, his looks, his personality, uh, racist, he's Hitler, stuff like that, stuff like that. And he knew this was coming, right? That's one of the reasons that I identify with Trump is his personality. He's, he's thick skinned. I know people say he's thin skinned, but he's really thick skinned. He takes a lot of abuse for very little. People hallucinate things to attack him about and then they do. There's there's a point in this book that talks about that. These bullies rally against him to try to attack him and bring him down. And you know I've been attacked for my beliefs my entire life, being being a right wing, uh, limited government Christian, open theist. I've been attacked so many times by so many people. You know I deal with it. I think I think I have thick skin, and it's good. It's good what Trump does, where he punches back. He doesn't let it stand. He gives people a taste of their own medicine. And these people, they can't, they can't even, uh, they they can't endure a fraction, a fraction of the abuse that Trump has dealt with his entire time alive and and running for president and in his presidency. They can't deal with what he deals with on a daily basis. And I identify with that. I I resonate with that because I myself have taken a lot of abuse over the years. So, here's the here's here's that quote that I found. <clears throat> One of one of his skill sets, one of his skill set stacks that this book talks about. It talks about how you don't need to be a master at certain things, but you do need a good skill set stack. And one such skill set stack is that he's uh, thick skinned. He says Trump's critics like to label him thin skinned because he often attacks his critics. But counterattacking is good persuasion. It tells people that being his friend is better than being his critic. So while Trump looks thin-skinned on the 2D checkerboard, he is actually super hardened against criticism because he has endured a lifetime of it. When he ran for president, he had to know this abuse would be 10 times worse than anything he had experienced before. You don't sign up for that kind of abuse unless you know you can handle the shaming. Evidently, Trump can. It's a valuable skill and one you can learn. People always criticize Trump for his, his tweets, his attacking different people like these minor figures like like Kathy Griffin and stuff like that but what, what's he doing we already talked about changing the energy of the debate changing the energy of the discussion bringing everyone's focus to the things he wants to focus on we already talked about how uh, counter counterattacking is a good persuasion as well and it signals to people that if they're messing with him he's going to fight back CNN knows that if they publish fake news, it's going to be thrown in their face. So it gives them a little bit more incentive not to publish lies all the time. The book jumps around a little bit, so we're going to be kind of jumping around a little bit as well. Scott Adams is a trained hypnotist. He's studied uh, hypnosis and how it works and how it functions. And I've talked about that on this program before. It's interesting to the open theism debate because people overemphasize the extent that hypnosis works to get people to do what you want. People can only really be hypnotized to do things that they already want to do. So if you're trying to hypnotize someone like if that Naked Gun movie, that Leslie Nelson movie, to assassinate the Queen of England, it's not going to work. You can't just take an ordinary citizen and make them a sleeper cell and hypnotize them to do something that they don't already want. And that, for that reason, hypnotism doesn't work for things like smoking. It doesn't work for overeating. 
And because people like doing that. And smoking, it calms them down. It makes them feel better. And uh, eating, I, I like to eat. Food is good. So you, it's harder to hypnotize. You can't do it. <clears throat> people who want to do something, hypnotize them not to do that thing. You have to pick an area that they already want to overcome that hurdle. Maybe they're shy in social situations. They want to get over their shyness. And there's no real benefit for not being shy. That, that's, that's more of the type of things that you could hypnotize people to change. Scott, Scott Adams writes, But hypnosis can work well in situations where a subject has no objection to modifying an old behavior. For example, let's say you want to overcome a specific type of fear. In those cases, the subject has zero desire to keep the fear. The fear provides no pleasure or other benefit. You could hypnotize them in those situations. And so what this tells us is that people do have free will. Scott Adams is not a believer in free will. He doesn't think people have free will. He thinks that we're just kind of robots that that to meld to our situations. He doesn't prove that in here. And the fact that hip, hypnosis doesn't work the way that you would you would think it would, that the movies portray and that people are less susceptible to hypnosis than, than commonly is thought, suggests a lot better that we do have free will. We do have control of our own minds. We can make decisions. We do allow our internal thought process to decide what's going on. He, he thinks the opposite. Uh, his book is written from the opposite perspective that people are 90% irrational and 10% rational. And uh, they're very, very subject to persuasion techniques, which, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That doesn't count, contradict free will if people are irrational. Sure, people are irrational. Brian Kaplan, he's an economist. He actually writes about rational irrationality. People are more irrational in areas where there's a high cost to rationality you're at you're at a family thanksgiving dinner and someone's talking about how great minimum wages are <clears throat> but let's say you're an economist you know the facts minimum wages are going to hurt poor people it's going to make the entire country less well off and it's just going to destroy our production destroy our our way of life and it's going to hurt the poorest people the least skilled people in america are the biggest losers in this policy so you could either debate that and everyone's going to hate you because they don't understand economics or you could just accept that oh minimum wages are a good thing and your one vote your one vote on the the issue your one discussion debate on the issue it's not going to change a thing it's not going to be the deciding factor between having minimum wages and not having minimum wages. So in that sense, you're, you're rational to be irrational about the subject. There's a low potential that you could affect anything with your views on the subject, but there's a high social cost to holding that view. If that makes sense, rational irrationality. I think Scott Adams could uh, benefit greatly from interacting, uh, interacting with uh, Brian Kaplan's work on the subject. But let's go to... This is one of the better things I found in the book, this uh, idea of different levels of how to persuade people. Big fear is number one. What do the Calvinists do? Oh, fire, brimstone, you're going to go to hell, stuff like that. You're going to demean God. They, they go after big fears. And in that way, they could persuade their irrational audience into accepting Calvinism because if you're not accepting Calvinism, you're not identifying with these big fears that they are they're throwing out. Identity is number two. Calvinists have created themselves a niche little subculture that you're cool, you're you're to get into, you're you're rational, intelligent. You're the Bible guy. If you're the Calvinist in the group at a Bible study, you're the Bible guy. They're not. They're not. We we got to destroy that. We got to smash that identity if we're going to make any progress up against Calvinism. We need to show that they are irrational. They reject the Bible. They hate the Bible. In fact, they hate Yahweh. If Yahweh was God, they would not worship him. And that that we need to destroy this identity that they have crafted for themselves. That's one of our goals. And in a good debate, you need to do that. You need to create cognitive dissonance in their belief and you need to press it to such an extent that their worldview snaps. Their worldview needs to snap. There's a, this filter where they're the intellectual person. They're the one who cares about the Bible that needs to be crushed if there's going to be made any progress with these people. They're cultists. They're cultists. you got to break their cult mentality. Aspirations, habits, analogies, reason below. Scott Adams talks about how analogies are 
bad for debates. You you don't just set up a parallel il- instance and think that that you know that's very persuasive towards anyone. What I do in the in the Bible when I'm dealing with the Bible, I try not to use analogy so much as I use showing that my my opponent uh, just rejects all rationality. That he's he's a stupid person because he can't read. He can't read. You know, I think that's effective. So they they read a certain phrase, I, the Lord, do not change. And then there's the same phrase made about man. Well, what does this one about man mean? And they, they'll read it in an entirely different way than they will the one about God. And they have just shown the audience that they're a complete idiot. They can't read. They can't read. I love it. It's great. So even lower on the stack of persuasive issues, reasons. People tend not to care about facts and reason. And you know, I talked all already about my debate in high school. People just reject facts and reason. They they like they like fears. They like to focus on their feelings. They like to focus on group identities. They 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 don't care about what scholarship says about certain issues. They they like to reject that. They like to fall back into their emotions. You know, that's that's one of the biggest problems, the hurdles that open theism has has to jump. I think certain open theists do well to jump this hurdle. I think the Greg Boyds of the world do well because what do they focus on? They don't focus on reasons and facts per se. The Thomas J. Ords of the world as well. They focus on love. They focus on these meta issues that really resonate with people. And a lot of people are open theists because of the Boyds and the Ords of the world. And for that, I commend them. For that, I commend them. But it's not an appeal to facts, logic, and reason that's, that's creating that part of the movement. It's not the biblical scholarship. It's not the Walter Brueggemann, uh, the Terence uh, Fret theums of the world. So hypocrisy and word thinking are the lowest form of persuasion. Oh, you're a hypocrite. Well, you know, that's just a U2 argument. That doesn't mean I'm right if you're a hypocrite. Sure. Word thinking, uh, trying to say, oh, you open theists just think God's ignorant. You're not going to persuade any open theist at all to not be an open theist by saying that the open theist thinks God is ignorant. It's not going to work. It's not. You can't just enforce your your definitions of words onto a debate and expect people to accept your definitions and then change because of it. That's the lowest form of thinking. Oh, you're a heretic. Okay, deal with the issues. I don't care. Sure, whatever. I'm a, I'm a heretic. Deal with what I'm saying. I'm not going to change my mind because you call me a heretic. What do you think? What what are what are you like? Like three three years old? It doesn't work like that. Switching to the analogies here. So he talks about analogies. Analogies are good. Uh, it's a good way to explain a new concept. So if uh, people see this verse in Malachi about God not changing, and you say there are other options, and then you read a parallel verse about how man doesn't change and you say look this is how it's used over here it could not not definitely but it could be the same type of reading over in this verse so you introduce the concept and then what you have to do to sell the point is you look at the context of that second verse the malachi verse the context is god changing god changes in the context of malachi so what's more probable Something like this other verse that I already showed you over here about mankind not changing. Oh, no, mankind is pure immutability, simplicity outside of time. Or is it more likely that that's just about a character statement, that they're not going to change their character? And then the context is the deciding factor that God does change. God does do things. God does respond. Right. So analogies are useful in some respects, not in others. You can't say, oh, Trump is Hitler because... Uh, Hitler created a national highway and Trump does that. You know, analogies, they, they fall apart. They're not good persuasive methods. Fears, though, fears are very persuasive. Oh, you're going to go to hell. It, a lot of people convert to Christianity based on the fear of hell. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a fact people do. And I'm not going to say that's a bad thing that people do that. But it, it does work. Fear is a big motivator. Oh, if you don't worship the God of Calvinism, then you're worshiping a false God. It's a fear. They're interjecting a fear. You're in danger of hellfire. You're a heretic. Sure, if if you get if you brand that that alternate view, if you if you brand Trump as Hitler and you get that to stick, it creates this fear. The fear is what's persuasive. The word thinking is not. Does if that makes sense? So if your word thinking has fear involved and that it, it actually sticks and resonates to your audience, 
that can be effective in certain circumstances. So it's good to have disarming techniques to to shift the emotions, shift the energy of the debates and discussions to other issues. And refocusing to the Bible is my favorite. That is, that is the high ground maneuver. And it will work in any debate on any subject, refocus to the Bible, because the Bible is where open theism excels. Uh, this, this crazy emotional fear talk, it is not. Maybe if you're the Greg Boy, it's the Thomas Ords of the world, you could get away with that. But uh, I, I prefer the high ground maneuver to the Bible. All right, this, this uh, podcast is already going long, and so we're going to have to cut this off. I didn't quite hit all the, the major points of the book. The book's good. It's interesting. I don't know if you want to spend $15 on the Kindle edition. You could probably get away with it. You'll probably get something from it if, you're, if you like how people operate, how people are persuaded. Uh, it might work for you. But uh, if, you, if you're a follower of his Periscopes or his blog, you probably don't need to read this book because it, it doesn't seem like there's any new information in it uh we're gonna just end talking about this two ways to win no way to lose Uh, let's talk about the duffy slick debate so duffy challenges slick to a debate if slick debates then duffy wins because duffy gets to present his side of the argument he gets to present open theism as biblical he gets to counter slick's uh characterizations of open theism and really, I really I think this debate's going to go pretty well for open theists in general. It's going to work. He said we're going to win. We're going to win the debate. But if Slick would back out of the debate, if Slick keeps uh, rejecting it, then we point out their cowardice. We could point out that Calvinists they don't debate, they don't care about discussion, and they're very afraid of open theism. So two ways to win, no ways to lose. And I think Will Duffy uh, capitalized on that fairly well. Otherwise, there's other topics that we didn't hit, making different slogans, different uh, persuasion techniques, how, do, how you set yourself up as the winner, showing confidence, that's the main one. So if you're in a debate, in a discussion, show confidence in what you say. Your confidence is more important than the words you say. Crazy enough. That's, that's how people operate. All right. So any questions, comments on this podcast, please send that to godisopenquestions at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.